I am Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. Mayor Bob Filner unveils his plan to get cars out of the heart of Balboa Park. The plaza was one of the big projects Jerry Sanders supported as mayor, but not the only one stopped in its track. Sanders' reaction and what it might mean for his legacy. I'm Peggy Pico. A new facility opens its doors to help San Diego military families. What it offers and why government programs are falling short. And San Diegans attend the first Del Mar Fair in 1936. Now local communities want to say in how the fairgrounds are managed. Details on that unusual plan just ahead. And the country's only school for homeless students gets a major upgrade, growing five times larger than before. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner has released his plan for the Plaza de Panama, remove all parking and close it to traffic on weekends. Filner's plan calls for resurfacing the plaza and moving parking to other parts of Balboa Park. The plaza would be open to traffic during the week, but not on weekends. Uh, Filner opposed a previous plan for a new bypass bridge to divert traffic. It was also rejected by a judge. Most of uh, San Diego's labor unions say they'll accept a five-year contract if it includes a 14.5% pay raise. The deal includes acceptance of one part of pension reform, limiting the pay used to calculate retirement benefits. The pay raise averages out to about 3% a year over five years. More than 4,000 people gathered in Boston to honor an MIT police officer killed last week. Police say he was ambushed by the suspected Boston Marathon bombers. One of the speakers at today's service, Vice President Joe Biden. Why, whether it's Al-Qaeda central out of the Fatah or two twisted, perverted, cowardly knockoff jihadis here in Boston, why do they do what they do? I've thought about it a lot because I deal with it a lot. And I've come to the conclusion, which is not unique to me, but I do it, they do it to instill fear. fear. Authorities say the surviving bombing suspect has given them a motive, anger over U.S. wars in Muslim countries. And they say the other suspect was added to a terrorism database 18 months ago. They tell the Associated Press the CIA put Tamerlan Tsarnaev on a list after the Russian government contacted FBI about him. Now, PBS NewsHour will have more on the investigation at 7 and a talk with the man in charge of One Fund Boston. It's already raised more than $20 million for the bombing victims. The search for an accused kidnapper ended today in a rehab center just south of Tijuana. Tobias Summers is accused of kidnapping and assaulting a 10-year-old girl in the Los Angeles area last month. The search briefly led to San Diego, and Mexican police turned him over to the FBI here this afternoon. Rattlesnakes are waking from hibernation, and the county health agency is warning folks to stay vigilant. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy has some tips on what to do if you're bitten by a rattlesnake. San Diego emergency rooms are preparing for another busy season of venomous snake bites and urging people to be on the lookout. The warning comes two days after five-year-old Sanaya Etheridge of East County was bitten on the foot by a rattlesnake near her home. That bit by a rattlesnake and it was a small one. And the small ones give you a, a lot of poison up in you. Catherine Conzen is medical director of urgent care centers at Rady Children's Hospital. She says after a bite, time is of the essence. The success rate of rattlesnake bites in terms of being completely recoverable is about 98 to 99 percent, and that's if they get the antivenom within two hours. Conzen says first call 911, keep the victim calm and the affected body parts still and below the level of the heart. 
Kanzen says common mistakes can make things worse. Never apply a tourniquet that will cut off blood supply. Do not cut a hole to try to let the area bleed because bleeding becomes a problem with snake bites. Lieutenant Kalani Hudson of the San Diego County Department of Animal Services says they responded to a dozen rattlesnake calls this week alone. She says eliminating food sources from your yard will help keep the snakes away. Don't leave bird feeders with seed out on the ground or pet food out. You want to make sure that any sort of brushy areas are trimmed back so that way you can see what's underneath. Sanaya is expected to make a full recovery. Her mom, Samantha Etheridge, hopes other parents can learn from their experience. It was a very scary ordeal, um, but I'm glad that she's better and she's on the road to recovery. And we had a lot of people that played a part in helping her get to where she's at now. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. Federal agents say they've arrested seven people in a fishy plot. They're accused of selling the bladders of an endangered Mexican fish. It's illegal to catch the Mexican giant bass, but poachers can get $10,000 apiece for its bladder. They're considered a delicacy in Chinese soup, like shark fins. Border agents say the fish are being caught in the Sea of Cortez, smuggled into the U.S., and then sent on to Asia. San Diego's air quality got another F from the American Lung Association. The group's annual State of the Air report puts San Diego among the 25 most polluted cities. But the association says California is making progress in cleaning up its air, and we're having fewer days with unhealthy air compared to reports in 2000. Well, add Los Angeles to the list of those opposed to restarting the San Onofre nuclear plant. L.A. Council is calling on federal regulators to wait for public hearings before deciding on a restart. The plant's operator is asked to restart at partial power on June 1st. Mayors from several local cities weighed in on a recent debate over who controls the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Peggy Pico joins us with an update. San Diegans attended the first Del Mar Fair in 1936. The fairgrounds are owned by the state and run by a nine-member board appointed by the governor. But that could change as the county seeks to jointly manage the fairgrounds to allow for more local control. The County Board of Supervisors met yesterday to discuss the proposal. And here with an update is County Supervisor Dave Roberts. Supervisor Roberts, thanks for uh, coming back, talking to us about this. Now, what type of issues uh, need to be controlled or should be controlled by by local authorities, do you think? Well, I think this is an issue about a $90 million enterprise right here in San Diego County. It's a true treasure, but many people want to have more local control. And you have to remember, this, this is a facility that operates 365 days a year. It's open 24-7, and there's many activities that go on there. Yesterday, people were talking nostalgically about the fair or the races, but things go on there. Just looking at the calendar this month. There's over 20 events scheduled just this month at the fair from garden shows, horse shows, um, you know, racing and other type of things that are going on there. And right now the uh, state is in charge of all that. Currently the governor appoints nine board members. Um, they have to be San Diego County residents, but he appoints nine board members to serve on this and all other fair boards. And what we're, we're wanting to see is having more local appointments of people that have more of a vested interest in this treasure. Why do the local communities you, Del Mar Fairgrounds are within your district. You, you know about the community's needs there. Why are they interested? Well, the piece of property actually straddles three communities, the city of San Diego, the city of Solana Beach, and the city of Del Mar. Those cities have the most local impacts that public safety impacts, um, noise and light. There's just many traffic. things. Traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I was sharing yesterday that we actually have to change our travel patterns when we know events are there. Just a few weeks ago, there was a gun show held on the property. We could not get in and out of that area. We actually had to go through Rancho Santa Fe to get to our home on the east side of Solana Beach because the freeway was gridlocked. So there are these concerns that people have of the impact that this property has. It has positive impacts too. So don't get us wrong. Right. And that's why we're trying to find a solution that works for everyone. Well, certainly a lot has changed. The area has expanded since 1936, since the fair began and on all these other changes happened. One of the ideas that came up, and I believe you guys agreed upon, was this five extra members on the board. Tell us about that. 
right? And you have to remember when this property, it was originally a golf course, and when they built the fairgrounds on it, it was for fairgrounds. And now, again, it's operated all the time. There's off-site wagering and other things. What we want to do is have five appointed um, board members added to the board. Each supervisor on the San Diego County Board of Supervisors would get to appoint one member. I believe that's a step in the right direction because as one supervisor, I will get to appoint one person from my community or myself, depending on what we decide to do. And each of the other supervisors can either appoint themselves or one member from their community. You also had an idea you brought up at the meeting about uh, non-voting members. Where does that stand? Yeah, I found when you bring people to the table in the cities of San Diego, Del Mar, and Solana Beach would really like a seat at the table. I know that that's not possible at this time, so I proposed having ex officio non-voting seats. We recently settled a CEQA lawsuit with the fairgrounds. We got the three jurisdictions together. We worked on this for over a day and came up with a solution. So I think having people having a seat at the table, getting the information, understanding what's going on, sharing local impacts, that's good. And that's what I want to see as we continue continue to evolve what this board's going to look like. So this was voted in favor uh, last night's meeting. So what is the outcome? Where do you go from here? So, so yesterday we voted 5-0 to say continue the process, let the state and the um, the county work on uh, any agreements. I ask that they take having ex officio non-voting seats for the three communities, see where this goes, bring it back within 60 days, and then let's keep building on this to bring control of that property down here to the county and the local communities. What kind of a what changes would the public actually notice if this plan uh, moved forward? I think the public won't really see any changes. What this will really do is control the operations of that property. There was a proposal recently to sell this to Del Mar. There's been proposals to build lots of new structures. What this will do is really control that property so it's really used for its purpose, which is to have agricultural related events on that property. All right, and certainly none of that's going to happen in time for the June 8th uh, opening of the Del Mar Fair this year so people can follow it for, for next year. We're all looking forward to the fair and I hope everybody comes out and <laughs> I'll see you there. Okay, I'll see you there too. Supervisor Roberts, thanks so much for the update. Thank you very much. Let's say things were a little easier today for air travelers in Southern California, but after three days of flight delays, the White House says it's willing to consider legislation stopping furloughs for air traffic controllers. Furloughs are one result of federal budget cuts. More than 5,800 flights were delayed this week. That's more than double the number of delays last year. The Federal Reserve says the new $100 bill will go into circulation in October. The new bills will still have Benjamin Franklin, but also have a new security ribbon and other features to prevent counterfeiting. Production problems delayed the bills for more than two years. This will complete the Fed's money makeover program. It's already updated fives, tens, and twenties. No changes for the $1 bill. ACLU is suing California over English language instruction in public schools. Back in January, we told you about an ACLU report saying 20,000 students weren't getting served. Some of those students were in the Grossmont Union High School District, and one of them is a plaintiff in the suit filed today. The district says the ACLU report was flawed. It says some of the students it mentions were actually in advanced English classes. After leaving office, former Mayor Jerry Sanders took a long vacation. He just got back and found some... Some of his biggest accomplishments got stopped in their tracks. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser spoke with Sanders about the projects and his legacy. Jerry Sanders' new office is still pretty empty. The former mayor runs the Chamber of Commerce, but he hasn't yet filled his bookshelves or hung decorations on the walls. During his vacation, Sanders didn't follow San Diego news. You know, my wife didn't let me read the newspaper while I was in Italy. But she made an exception. She told him about a court blocking the Plaza de Panama project, which would have removed cars from the center of Balboa Park. Sanders pushed strongly for the plan, so the news was upsetting. I think that's very unfortunate. Uh, we had somebody uh, who was willing to step up and pay for the entire project uh, to clear probably the ugliest parking lot in San Diego out and create a grand meeting space. but. Uh, obviously, in San Diego, lawsuits are a part of life. A part of life, indeed. Plaza de Panama isn't the only Sanders project facing legal challenges.
several of his accomplishments have been mired in court battles or otherwise diminished. The question is, do the problems that popped up after Sanders left office tarnish his mayoral legacy? First, a quick review of his biggest projects. The new downtown library is almost complete, so mark that off as a win. Plaza de Panama, not so much. Even if it's revived, Sanders says Erwin Jacobs, the plan's financial backer, likely won't be involved. You know, I really think it's a dead issue right now. Um, I think that you can't expect somebody who's willing to donate 24 or 30 million dollars uh, to just leave that money hanging there. The convention center expansion downtown is also facing legal challenges. Then there's pension reform. Sanders successfully reduced pension benefits for new city employees. But voter approved Proposition B is also hung up in court. It's a legally defensible measure that will save taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Pensions are part of what Sanders considers his biggest accomplishment, the city's budget. I think that was really the primary reason that I got involved was to help fix the finances of the city and I feel good about the way that that was taken care of. But Steve Erie, a UC San Diego political professor, says the budget is still broken. We had a, a false rumor last year from the mayor, Mayor Sanders, that the budget was balanced and there was going to be a surplus going five years out. Well, that balanced budget lasted for about a month and a half. Still, Erie says, Sanders should be given credit. There is actually uh, a lot to be said for a mayor that stepped in in the throes of a fiscal crisis. There were scandals. Mayors had resigned. Somebody to put a steady hand on the ship of state. And I think, I think Jerry accomplished that. Even if all Sanders' projects succeed, some do not see them as signs of a great mayor. That's because they all focus on one part of San Diego, downtown. Jerry Sanders was a great, great mayor for downtown. He was not so great a, a, a mayor for the neighborhoods. Mesa College politics professor Carl Luna says Sanders was like many mayors in his focus on downtown. City Hall is downtown. The lobbyists for the business interests are downtown. The convention industry is downtown. And so if you're out in Normal Heights, if you're up in Mira Mesa, you don't get a whole lot of love from 202 C Street. But Sanders points out he improved roads and other infrastructure throughout San Diego. And he says focusing on downtown is good for the rest of the city. You're always keeping an eye on downtown and working on issues there to create the revenue stream for the rest of San Diego, and that's one of the things that we worked on. But Luna sees another reason for this so-called edifice complex. San Diego mayors don't usually move on to higher offices. So what you do here in your time in office is probably how you're going to be remembered. Sanders laughs at the thought of running for office again. He's definitely done. Last week, he did some more traveling on a business trip to Mexico. There, he spent some time with new mayor Bob Filner. And that I will well and faithfully. Sanders says he understands the reasons Filner has picked so many battles in his first months in office. The council's going to be testing him. He's going to be testing everybody to see what power he has. And I don't think it, uh, it always looks as good to the public. Sanders hopes to work with the new mayor on promoting small business and fixing up roads. He also isn't worried about his mayoral legacy or whether the projects he undertook end up succeeding. I guess what people ask, you know, how you feel when you're out of office, you can only do what you can when you're in office and when you leave. Uh, it's up to somebody else, and I, I don't feel bad about that. Uh, people voted for term limits uh, and said we want changes in leadership from time to time, and I certainly respect that, uh, and I think it's a healthy thing. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Next week, Sanders and other former mayors will join us for a KPBS special broadcast looking at issues like growth and development, pension reform, and infrastructure needs. Join us one week from tonight at 6.30 p.m. right here on KPBS-TV. From an open school to an open house, Operation Homefront California is holding an open house event tonight. Peggy Pico has more on the organization and who it helps. 
Operation Homefront is a nonprofit organization that assists newly returned veterans, active military, and their families that aren't getting the help they need through federal armed service programs. Here with further details is Jack Sherrick, Executive Director of the California Chapter. Jack, welcome. Thank you, Peggy. I appreciate you having me here. I think a lot of people may recall that Operation Homefront has been in San Diego for some time, but what are some of the changes? Well, the organization started in 2002. The, the really big change for us is we've got a new field office and uh, we're expanding our service into Northern California. Uh, historically, we had just done Southern California. That new office is in Miramar. What kind of services does it offer? Um, well, we still provide all the same services that we did. So we still provide emergency assistance to you know military families and wounded warriors. And then in addition, you know, we run morale programs throughout the year. Um, you know, through those offices. And the the big thing, you know, with the warehouse there is that you know we're allowed to store all of our supplies for those morale and emergency services like uh, baby needs. Yeah, know. I was going to say, break down for us what emergency services might might be. Right. Well, you know, emergency services is really kind of a, a very broad term because it could be just about anything. It could be rent assistance. It could be getting an auto repair, you know, anything like that. You know, when we have a military family who has a deployed service member, you know, and that spouse runs into a problem of some kind that they're not financially able to take care of, you know, they can come to us and get assistance. So it really just depends on what their specific need is, and we have caseworkers that will work on them with that. Why aren't the federal armed service programs providing this sort of service? You know, I mean, a lot of them do. I mean, there's there's organizations within um, each branch that provides emergency services. Um, but there are also nonprofit-based organizations as well. Uh, you know, I think the reality is, you know, like any organization, the government, you know, has limited funding to support all of the services that it needs to. Um, you know, and it does the best it can with what it has. You know, fortunately, there's a lot of great organizations out there like Operation Homefront um, that are willing to step up and, you know, fill the gap when it's needed to be filled. You had mentioned this uh, morale. You, you have some core programs for that. Yeah. Tell us about those. Yeah, the morale programs that we run, uh, we have Back to School Brigade, which is where we provide children with backpacks and school supplies to kind of help them kick off the school year. And then we also do a holiday toy drive every single year. And then we're just starting up our Star Spangled Babies program. I mean, we've always done what baby showers. Uh, they're baby showers. Mm -hmm. We've always done baby showers, but the difference is now is that we've really kind of branded the whole thing so that we can really get out there and market it into the military community and, you know, show them, you know, that we're really behind that military family. How many San Diegan families in the military have received aid from uh, Operation Wow, Humphrey? yeah, that's, you know, I... Overall, in the state of California, I don't have specific San Diego numbers, but um, 9,000 morale and 648 emergency needs were filled in 2012. More troops are coming home from Afghanistan, yes. and San Diego is certainly home to a lot of uh, newly returned and other veterans. Uh, what are some of the major f uh, hurdles they face when they, when they come home? Sure. You know, I mean, of course, you know, the, the big thing for any service member returning is reintegrating with that family unit, right? I mean, they've been apart. Things have been different. Uh, for the individuals who were actually, you know, injured or wounded, you know, in conflict, I mean, it's an entirely different process. I mean, you have individuals coming back with very visible injuries like amputations, uh, and then you have individuals coming back with silent injuries like post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, which are putting a severe strain, you know, not only on the service member, but their family as well. So, you know, we work with them to help them wherever we can. You were in the military for a long time, and, and, and you've been working here. Um, do you feel the need has grown significantly for this sort of stopgap measure? You know, the need's always been there. You know, when I first joined the service, you know, 21 years ago, um, I was a young sailor. Um, I was an E2, and I had a wife and a daughter, and I, I ran into a very similar circumstance. You know, at the time, an organization like Operation Homefront didn't exist, you know, so I just had to really kind of work my way through it. So I, I don't think this is a new problem. I think what we're facing that's new is the injuries, right, the wounded warriors that are coming back. I mean, that's the, the big thing now that's different. Where do you get your funding, and, and how can San Diegans help? All of our funding is uh, from private donors, so be that corporate sponsorships, um, various foundations, or you know individual giving. Um, anyone who wants to help uh, can visit our website at www.operationhomefront.net. There's a donation button there, and you know they can get involved that way, or they can give volunteer time. You know, just call us. Our, all of our information is right there on the website. Okay, and I want to let people know that they can go to our website, uh, kpbs.org, for a link to that and also for more information about Operation Homefront. So, Jack Sherrick, thanks so much for talking Absolutely. I appreciate it. We have an update tonight on a story we brought you more than a year ago about a major transformation for a one-of-a-kind school in San Diego. It's called Monarch Like the Butterfly, and it's become a national model serving children impacted by homelessness. 
From its gleaming entrance to its open, airy interior, the Monarch School has been transformed from a cramped downtown space on Cedar Street to this newly remodeled two-story building in Barrio Logan, just south of Petco Park. When we visited 14 months ago, this fixer-upper didn't look like much, but it now accommodates up to 350 homeless students from grades K through 12. You know, we really believe that if they want to come to the school and, and, and ready to learn, a big piece of it is health. Principal Joel Garcia says the new health care center is an important addition to the campus. Um, there might be a toothache or an issue of, you know, glasses and not being able to pay for them, and so they can't, you know, read the board. Um, and so how, you know, how can we expect them then to do their schoolwork if, if they can't, you know, see the board in the classrooms? Another barrier to school for homeless kids is clothing. The Butterfly Boutique is stocked with public donations and students are free to pick out whatever they need. You know, they come to school sometimes and, you know, their shoes are worn, they're torn. They, they don't have the, the appropriate clothing, whether it's warm clothing or something that, that fits. Families with children are among the fastest growing segment of the homeless population, with an estimated 18,000 homeless children in San Diego County. Domestic violence and poverty are just a couple of the reasons why. Through the help of counselors and different partnerships that we have in the community, starting to address some of those issues that are going on for our students. And again, the whole idea is to get them back into the classroom ready to learn. Garcia says the new campus will level the playing field with modern classrooms and equipment, a science lab, an outdoor playground. And with 25 years under its belt, more than 70% of its students graduate high school. This community has gathered together and has donated so much time and energy and work and in-kind gifts. It's really a community school that was built by so many people. The remodel cost about $14 million and was fully funded by donations to the school's capital campaign. Quick look at the forecast. Rain along the coast tomorrow, at least through the morning. Then a mix of sun and clouds, uh, both inland as well as along the coast, warming in the mountains and warm and sunny out in the desert. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.